All right. Well, we are in the book of Colossians. Go ahead and turn there. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the recent study that we had in our Christ and Culture series. I think it was needed. You've given us good feedback that it was helpful. But I don't know about you, but I'm glad to now be back in a normal flow of things where we're taking a book and we're going verse by verse. And today we're going word by word uh, through a book of the Bible. And what a glorious book we have before us. I know many of you have said this is your favorite book in the Bible. My favorite book of the Bible is whichever one I'm reading, whichever one I'm preaching. I've just come to have that answer about things because they are all good, right? But there is a definite beginning and a definite end to this book, whereas our series of Christ and culture just could have gone on and on and on. Actually, there's 1,582 words in the oldest and best manuscripts of the book of Colossians. So that's how specific we are here. 1,582 words that God inspired the Apostle Paul to write. Would you take a moment and stand with me? And while we're going to read verses 1 through 8, we're really just going to camp out in verses 1 and 2 today. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. And because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. You may be seated. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Most of us know who Paul is. We know of his conversion story. We've made it through the book of Acts together, and not once, not twice, but three times we have Paul's testimony in the book of Acts. But I want to linger here for just a moment because it is truly astonishing that Saul... Now Paul, a former blasphemer and persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ, is now in position to write this letter to a church we will learn that he never visited, but he had a great love for them as he had for all true Christians and his Lord Jesus. But it's important to be reminded of where he came from. Maybe you're here this morning and you've given up praying for someone. You've said, well, I've shared the gospel with him. I've prayed for her for years, and they're not interested. God must just not be going to save them. But I would encourage you, don't give up. Don't give up. I'm no example to be held high, but it was mentioned this morning in Sunday school that I shared the gospel with and prayed for my mom and dad for 28 years before they became Christians and went to glory But that pales in comparison to the Saul to Paul conversion. We don't have time to look at those three testimonies in Acts, but I encourage you, particularly Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 16. But I do want you to hold your finger there in Colossians and turn to one of Paul's other prison epistles. That's right, there's four prison epistles, um, Ephesians, Philippians, 
Colossians and Philemon. And I want you to hold your finger there in Colossians and turn back to Philippians for just a moment. For this is Paul's testimony in a theological form more than in a historical form. He says, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Amazing, amazing story. And again, go back to Acts 9 or Acts 22, uh, and I forget where the third one is, but there's three testimonies where Paul was on his high horse, literally, uh, headed to Damascus to continue to persecute the church of Jesus Christ, and he was knocked off of his horse both spiritually and literally, and he became a follower of Jesus And all of that zeal that was misdirected was now directed in the right way for the glory of the the Jesus that he was persecuting and of the church that Christ loved. Again, hold your finger there. Let's turn back one more book or two more books and go to Galatians because it, it started before the Damascus Road, you see, as it did for you as well. You may be thinking of your testimony, Galatians 1, 14 through 16. You may be thinking of your testimony, and you may be thinking, oh, I, I can tell you when it all started. And you, you guys know my story. And I, on a sense, I could say April 12th, 1990 is when it started for this person here. But no, it started way back, and Paul began to understand that. Listen to what he says in Galatians 1. 14 through 16, he says, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So Paul is seeing way before that day on the Damascus Road, God had had chosen me, had uh, selected me, even in my mother's womb, and we would argue in Ephesians even before that, in before the foundations of the world. So that's who Paul is. I know that's a quick sketch of it, but Paul, formerly known as Saul, now a lover of Jesus, a lover of the church for which Christ died. We'll see in a moment. Again, he never made it to Colossae. He did not start Colossae or the church in Colossae, but he heard of their faith. He heard of their struggles, that some false teachings were creeping in. And he, from prison in Rome, did not waste his imprisonment, but wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And we have the book here for us preserved. An apostle... He's an apostle. What is an apostle? Well, again, let's just take a moment and and comb through this and not take anything for granted. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 through 9, uh, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He's not denying his apostolic ministry. He's just saying, you know, these other apostles, they walked with Jesus. I I wasn't privileged to do that. I saw the, the risen Christ. He would teach me for three years in a different way than he taught the other apostles But I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I formerly persecuted the church of God. Mark chapter 3, let's see what Jesus is doing by setting up this this ministry through his 12 apostles. Mark 3, 13 and 14. And he went up to the mountain and summoned those 
whom he himself wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. So all of the disciples were not apostles, but all of the apostles were disciples because a disciple means a follower, a student of Jesus. But not every disciple who followed Jesus had this designation as my spokesman, as my ambassador, as one who will be sent in my name and who will write for me and speak for me as my ambassador, as I will now go to the right hand of the Father and still be communicating truth. We went through John, or we're going through John in Sunday school. I hope you'll join us. Uh, about a month ago, we were in John 16, and I think this is an important verse. Listen to John 16, 12, and 13, because it shows us that these apostles who would be speaking, thus saith the Lord, who would be writing things that we would see as Scripture, binding, authoritative, uh, how do we know they got it right? How do we know they weren't just winging it, coming up with their own opinions? Listen to these three sections of Scripture here. John 16, 12 through 13. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. That's the work of the spirit of God in the apostles, recalling to their minds the things that Christ had spoken and that they're writing with Holy Spirit inspiration. 1 Corinthians gives us some similar commentary on this. Listen to these two passages, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, and 1 Corinthians 14, 37 through 38. Paul says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And then listen to how bold he is to say this in chapter 14, verse 37 and 38. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandments. But if anyone does not recognize this, neither is he to be recognized. Do you feel the weight of that? Paul's saying, I'm not writing my own words. I'm writing the very commands of Jesus Christ. And if, how did he put that? He says, um, and if you do not recognize that, then you are not to be recognized. So that word apostle means one who is speaking on behalf of Christ, one who is writing on behalf of Christ, an ambassador, a, a sent one. And Paul is saying, oh, I used to be Saul, but now I'm Paul. I, I was lost, but now I'm saved. And now I've been, I'm not worthy of it because I was persecuting the church of, of Jesus Christ, but I've been called to be an apostle. And this is why Paul can speak so boldly this is why he can speak so compassionately, because he is not just winging it. He is speaking on behalf of Jesus Christ, which is the next word in our sentence here. Do you see this? Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus or of Jesus Christ. Now, surely, surely we know who Christ Jesus is. But I don't want to take anything for granted um, as I said this morning, I was sharing the gospel with two young men yesterday, and they looked at me like I was speaking some foreign language. This is Paul's authority. He's saying, I'm an apostle of, possessive of Christ Jesus. Christ means Messiah. We just sang about that. It means God's promised one. God's anointed one. You go back to Genesis chapter 3, 15, the first mention of a promised deliverer. And he shall bruise you on the hill and you shall crush his head. This is 
what the word Christ means, the long awaited for Messiah and promised Savior. The name Jesus, the name that is above all names. We love this name Jesus. It's founded on the Hebrew word Yahshua, which means the Lord saves, and its Greek counterpart, Jesus, means the Lord saves. There's many scriptures we could look at, but one that we probably thought of during our Christmas time recently is Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will, not he might, he will save his people from their sins. Well, much more could be said about Christ and trust me, we're going we're gonna to learn more about Christ in this book, Pound for Pound, probably the most Christ-exalting book in our Bible. So mo more to say about that, but I just wanted to say, Paul, an apostle of this promised Messiah, promised long ago, has come into time and space, has accomplished salvation for his people on the cross and at the empty tomb. And then he throws in this phrase, by the will of God. Again, just underscoring that this isn't my own conniving. This isn't my manipulation. This is the will of God for my life. And it was even, form, it was even formed in the mind of God before Paul was formed in his mother's womb. Now, we're not called to be apostles with a big A. That's, that's done with. There are no more apostles with a big A because we have now the completed canon of Scripture. 39 Old Testament books, 27 New Testament books. So if you want to know what God says, we don't go looking for an apostle to speak to us. We see what His apostles have spoken and written in our Bibles. But how do you know the will of God for your life? How do you know the will of God for your life? Well, you can mark one thing off of what God's will for your life might be, and that is an apostle. Okay, we, we just discovered that. We just saw that. But how do you know what God's will is for your life? I'll just say this. What has God gifted you to do? What are you decent at? What gives you joy to do? And can you do that for his glory? And can you use that as a platform for sharing the gospel where you work, play, and live? And I'd say get busy doing that and then spend some time with other people who love Jesus and who love you called the local church. And they will, we will affirm that in your life. We'll say, you know what? God's blessed you with that. When you do that, that's very helpful. I can see God's hand on your life. Or have you considered anything else? <laughs> have you considered trying anything else? Now, just briefly, he says, and Timothy, our brother. This is important. I'm going to spend just a moment with this. He doesn't call Timothy his child in the faith, which he does in other places. He doesn't call Timothy here his co-laborer, which he does in other places. He calls him our brother. And then he's going to mention brother again in verse 2. He says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. I remember preaching through the book of Acts and what a delight it was to see that on Paul's first missionary journey, that's when we believe Timothy, young Timothy, a child, heard the gospel. Years later, Paul would circle back the wagons and go back to that area of Derby and Lystra and he would find a now converted Timothy. And he sees the hand of God on this young man's life. And he says, I want him to follow me and, and be my apprentice, be my uh, co-laborer, be my, uh, my, my partner in the, in the gospel. 
And so in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, we see Paul also came to Derbe and Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this young man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. It's interesting why Paul had Timothy circumcised but said, Titus, don't you dare get circumcised. Let's talk about that around the uh, fellowship meal today if you have questions about that. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, I've never had anybody like Timothy. I've never. Such a faithful man. I've never had anybody like him. I told you that Paul never visited Colossae. L listen to this for just a moment. Just, just look up with me for a moment. Th this is pure gold, guys, and I hope I can communicate it clearly to you. But I want you to notice the, the wildfire nature of the gospel. And what I mean by wildfire is it's meant to come into your life and not stop with you, but spread like an out-of-control wildfire. There Paul was on his first missionary journey preaching. He didn't know that someone in the crowd named Timothy heard the gospel. He, he didn't know that probably. And so maybe he goes back to Jerusalem to report of how the first missionary trip went. And maybe he said, well, I don't, I don't know. They all sort of stared at me. I don't know who got it and who didn't. But then when he goes back, he sees, he sees that the seed that was planted, the Spirit of God has been watering it, and now it, it's, it's ready to be harvested. Same thing about Epaphras. Remember in verse 7, we read about this man named Epaphras. Epaphras was from Colossae, about 100 miles east of, Eph of Ephesians, of, excuse me, of, of Ephesus. And while Paul spent three years in Ephesus preaching and teaching, Colossae, uh, excuse me, Epaphras made his way to Ephesus. Eph oh boy, Lord help me. To Ephesus. And he heard the gospel, and then he went back home. And shared the gospel with his fellow brothers and sisters and family members in Colossae. And a church was started. And historians believe he was the pastor of that church. Paul never made it there. But the gospel made it there through Paul's preaching. And this man named Epaphras heard it, took it back home, said, You can't, be, I can't wait to share some good news with you. The plot thickens. It was, as we read the book of Philemon, that church in Colossae started meeting in Philemon's house, whom Paul had led to Christ at another occasion. And you know the story in Philemon. Onesimus, the runaway slave, makes his way to Paul, who's in prison, and Paul shares the gospel with him and leads him to Christ and says, you go back to Philemon, but send this letter with you. Because I'm going to tell Philemon that he needs to pardon you and forgive you because you're now a brother in Christ. Isn't that amazing to see how the gospel is just spreading like wildfire? I've asked you this question before, but so don't answer it if you've heard it. But Mordecai Ham, most of us don't know that name, but he's the relatively unknown man who led Billy Graham to Christ. Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher who went to a shoe store and found a young man named D.L. Moody there working and shared the gospel with Dwight L. Moody, and Moody became a Christian. We don't know Edward Kimball. We don't know Mordecai Ham. We do know Billy Graham. We do know D.L. Moody. Sometimes it works that way where you don't know of the man who led someone who was used mightily of God to Christ, but sometimes it works the other way. We know of Paul, but we don't know of Epaphras or Philemon 
or Onesimus. We don't know of them too well. We don't know of Timothy as well as we know of Paul, but it doesn't matter if it works this way or if it works this way. The point is, when the gospel comes and God saves, He never intends for that gospel to stop with you. Who shared the gospel with you? Oh, let's talk about that as well at our fellowship meal. This fellowship meal is going to have to be a long meal, isn't it? We've got a lot to talk about. Well, thank God for them, whoever it was who shared the gospel with you. And you received it. Now, who are you sharing the gospel with? I encourage you, through this study of Colossians, where we see the gospel spreading like wildfire, pray and make a list of people that you want to be sharing the gospel with. Do you dare even begin fasting for them? Remember in our Christ and Culture series, Christopher Yawn's mother prayed, for seven, prayed and fasted for seven years for her son's conversion. At one point, fasting for 39 days straight. May our baptismal waters stir. God is still in the saving business after all. Do you believe that? You know how I know that for a fact? Because if he had already saved the full number that he has chosen before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ would have returned. And he hasn't returned, so there's work to do. There's work to do. But Paul, he's already mentioned that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. But by mentioning Timothy alongside him, what Paul is doing is he's not just flexing his muscles and saying, you better listen to me because I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. By pulling Timothy, who is not an apostle, alongside him, he is relating to this church. Remember, he's never been there. But he's saying, I love Timothy. He's our fellow brother, our fellow brother. And you are our fellow brothers, Church of Colossae. He's, he's relating to them. He's endearing himself to them. He's kind of doing what he did in the book of Philemon. Listen to this. If you know that book, you'll remember this. He's, he's writing to Philemon. He says, Though I have confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, in other words, to forgive Onesimus, to receive him back, to pay his debt, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the old man who's now in prison, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. You see what Paul's doing? He's saying... It's not about my way or the highway. I'm not throwing my weight around. I am throwing the love of Christ around. That's what I'm doing. And that's important for those of us who are in authority. And to some level, that's all of us, right? Whether you're a parent, whether it's in your workplace, at school, among your peers, at church. Learn from this. Learn from this. Don't just throw your weight around and say, you'll do this because I said you'll do this, even though you might have the right to do that. Paul, who certainly had that right, said, oh, I, look at Timothy. He's right here with me, and he's going to send this letter to you. He'll get it to you. And now, here's what I really want to focus on. I don't know how long it took for that, but here's what I really want to focus on. He says this, to the saints. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Let me get that last part out of the way. Paul always begins, every, every letter he writes, all 13 letters, he begins it with grace to you, and he ends it with grace with you. And I think that's important. He's saying right at the front end of reading this letter. So they would have read this whole letter to the church. Now we're not doing that. We're going verse by verse, word for word. But he's saying, may God's grace be with you, or grace to you rather, as you're reading it, understanding it, applying it. And then as you close the book and go outside to 
to home and, and to work tomorrow morning. May God's grace be with you. So I, I've, I've prayed. I've prayed a lot this morning that as the word is being preached, that God's grace would come to you and to me. And I've prayed that as we wrap it up in a moment, God's grace would send us out the door with new vigor and insight and faith to obey the word of Christ. And of course, grace comes and then peace is the result. Romans 5, 1 tells us this, this logic uh, of the gospel. He says, uh, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a prayer, but it's also a Christian's reality. Now, to the saints. And by saints, he's not saying that's one group of you and then the faithful brethren is the other group. That word and links them together uh, further intensifying what the word saint means. It could be uh, said this way, to the saints, comma, even the faithful brethren, or to the saints slash faithful brethren. The Greek word here, hagios, means holy ones, set apart ones. It means Christians. If you are a Christian, you are a saint of God. You are made holy in Christ. You are positionally holy in Christ, and he's working that out practically in your life. This phrase, in Christ, I know Joe loves this phrase. He, he teed it up for me today in Sunday school. Uh, this phrase, in Christ, is used 19 times in the book of Colossians alone. It's used 143 times in the, in the New Testament, in Christ or in Him. We're talking about union with Christ. And oh, this is such a sweet doctrine. And I don't have time today to unpack all of it. We'll have to save some meat on the bone for next week. But look at Colossians 2, 6, and 7, just for sort of a summary of what that doctrine might look like. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in Him. Walk in Him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him, there it is again, and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Wayne Grudem defines union with Christ this way. He says, union with Christ is a phrase used to summarize several different relationships between believers and Christ through which Christians receive every benefit of salvation in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3, listen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He says this relationship includes the fact that we are in Christ, that Christ is in us, that we are like Christ, and that we are with Christ. I wonder if you've ever used a phrase of yourself or of other Christians, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Let me correct you this morning. That's not how you should refer to yourself. You should refer to yourself as a saint of Christ. Do you still sin? Absolutely. Wish we didn't, but we do. But to be theologically and biblically accurate, we are a saint who sins, not a sinner saved by grace. Do you see the difference a little bit? Forty times... Paul will refer to Christians, ordinary Christians, not those who have martyred, been martyred rather, and now they're in the, the annals of, of the hall of faith. That's not what a saint means. It means ordinary Christians like you and me who are still struggling with sin, but that's not our identity. Our identity is in Christ. At 40 times he refers to his brothers and sisters as saints. 
And really only one time does he use the noun sinner to describe a Christian. And that's himself. 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. And even in that situation, I don't think Paul is saying, that's my identity. I'm a sinner. He's saying, I am the least likely candidate to have received salvation because of my former life of blaspheme and persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. He does not mean that his identity is a sinner or that he is now living as the foremost of sinners right now. So 40 times... Saint, one time sinner. And even when we look at that, it, it, we see some, some different nuances to it. That's good news, my friends. That's your identity as God sees you. And, and which is truer, the way God sees you and describes you in the Scripture or the way you sometimes see yourself as you look in the mirror? Right? We, we talked a lot about that last two weeks at our Weekend in the Word and our Christ and Culture. How sometimes our brain will say something about us, or to us even, that's absolutely unbiblical and untrue. And we have to renew our mind with the Word of God so that we can begin thinking according to God's reality which, by the way, is reality, period. I told you, or Grudem tells us there's those four dimensions of union with Christ. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. We are like Christ. We are with Christ. I've got... I've got verses there to share with you, but I don't want to overwhelm you. How about this? I'll, I'll get a run and go next week and, and give you some of that for next week's message. Oh, it's rich. I felt like I had died and gone to heaven this week as I was studying union with Christ. John Murray sums it up this way in his book, Redemption Applied. He says, union with Christ has its source in the election of God the Father before the foundation of the world and has its fruition in the glorification in the sons of God in glory. The perspective of God's people is not narrow, it is broad and it is long. It is not confined to space and time. It has the expanse of eternity. Its orbit has two foci. One, the electing love of God the Father in the councils of eternity. The second, the glorification with Christ in the manifestation of His glory. The former has no beginning. The latter has no end. Why does the believer entertain the thought of God's determinate counsel with such joy? Why can he have patience in the perplexities and adversities of this present life? Why can he have confident assurance with reference to the future and rejoice in hope of the glory of God? It is because he cannot think of a past, a present, or a future apart from union with Jesus Christ. You see what I mean about thinking you, you've died and slipped into heaven already? Wow. My friends, my brothers in Christ, my sisters in Christ, don't walk around kicking rocks, shuffling through this world, saying, ah, oh, shucks, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Hold your head up high. Boast only in the cross, of course. I'm not saying boast in yourself, but hold your head up high and be reminded that in God's eyes, because of the person and work of Jesus Christ and your union with Him through faith, 
you are called a saint, a holy one, a set-apart one. And that's who you really are. And now we fight sin from victory. The, there's a world of difference between fighting for victory and fighting from victory. We fight from victory, my friends. We fight from victory. These are some interesting thoughts. I hope they're making a little bit of sense to you. Listen to one verse that I'll give you. Actually, two. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. I know that's weird talking, right? Leaven is a reference of sin. He's saying, hey, clean that sin out of your life. But he says, that you may be a new lump just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Well, which is it, Paul? Are we to clean out the sin in our life so that we'll be a new lump of unleavened bread? Or are we already a new lump of unleavened bread? And Paul says, yes. Yes. Because you're a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you therefore can walk in newness of life. So one way to put it would be fight from victory, not for victory. Another way to put it would be become what you already are. Become what you already are. That's the progressive sanctification in our lives. And it's due to the fact that we are in Christ right now. Christ is in us because of His finished work and our faith in Him. I, I love what Brian Chappelle says in his book, Christ-Centered Preaching. He says, Beware of the killer bees. Be a David. Be a Samson. Be a Ruth. Be a Naomi. That's not the gospel. You know that, don't you? But that's what some people call the gospel. They, they just stand up and whip people into an emotional frenzy and say, now go out and be a Daniel. Oh, dear God, if that's all Christianity is, I, I quit. I need Christ in me, right? I need to be in Christ but I love it. He says, beware of those killer bees. But once you've tasted the sweet honey of Jesus, the bees will follow. Woo! Somebody say amen on that one. Come on. Come on. Listen. Beware of the killer bees. But once you've tasted the sweet honey of Jesus, the bees will follow. Remember? He's saying, you are in Christ. Christ is in you. Now go live that out. He's not saying, go work hard for Jesus, and then Christ will be in you. Oh, that's deadly. That's deadly. If, if there is a bee that comes before all other bees, it would be, be in Christ. Be in Christ. Be saved. Be Christ's. Oh, that's so profound. I hope that that makes sense to you. I hope that that helps you. I close with this. As sweet as being in Christ is, and we're gonna, there's so much more to unpack on that, the opposite is so powerful as well. Not in a good way. What's the opposite of being in Christ? If Paul says... 140 times, be in him or be in Christ. If he says 19 times in this book alone, be in him, be in him, be in him. If 40 times he calls them saints and only once refers to Christians as sinners, 
what's the opposite of being in Christ? If you're not in Christ, you're in sin, you're in Adam, and you're in trouble. You're under the sway of the evil one. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, there it is, and I in him, there it is, he will bear much fruit, but apart from me you can do, finish it, nothing. nothing. That's how scary it is to be in Adam. That's how scary it is to be dead in your trespasses and sins. That's how scary it is to be in trouble that way. Or listen to how Paul put it in Romans 8. Listen to these words and we're done. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, it does not subject itself to the law of God, for indeed it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who now dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, we are heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. What a stark Contrast between being in Christ and being in the flesh that Paul gives us. My friends, I hope and I pray that you are in Christ and that Christ is in you. And if not, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? The invitation is available. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Repent of your sins, turn to Jesus, and walk in Him. He's available for any and all who will come to Him humbly. Let's pray. God, we thank You for this precious book. and We've just scraped the snowflakes on the tip of the iceberg. So much more to unpack so much more of Christ to behold, to see, and to savor. I pray that we would walk out of here today filled not with self-confidence, but filled with the hope of Christ in us, which is the hope of glory. Once again, God, if there's anyone listening to this, who is saying, I'm not in Christ, and Christ is not in me. I'm in the flesh, I'm in my sin, I'm in Adam, I'm in trouble. Oh God, today we've got good news for them. They don't have to leave in trouble. They can leave in Christ. And would you do that sweet work that you've done in so many of our lives of drawing them and grafting them into Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.